Good morning. Oh, good. There are people still in the room. Yes, I, I see many of you have found the coffee and delicious treats in the back. Please help yourselves. Once you've done that, I'm going to invite you to come join us. I want to welcome you all to the, I don't even know how many of these we've done, 14th-ish uh, prenatal to three uh, policy forum. My name is Catherine Hill. I'm an associate professor in the School of Social Work. We're delighted to welcome you all to the University of St. Thomas. Um, and I just am a big believer in passing on compliments when they're given. And I was at an internal retreat yesterday where there were a lot of muckety-mucks. Uh, that's an academic term for my boss. Um, and uh, the number of people who came up to me from multiple units of the university and said, I've heard about the great work that's happening at these early childhood prenatal policy forums, and we're so excited that the university gets to host these and bring people together, and there's such great work coming out of them, and this is so exciting. And so in the moment, I just said thank you. But uh, what I actually should have done is said, it's really all of you who are doing all of the wonderful work. So thank you to all of you for doing all the work, for coming out on a January morning to keep doing all of the work. Um, and I look forward to what we're going to be discussing today. So I believe Representative Pinto is the next. I do have the clicker. Nope, oh, there you are. You're next. OK. Welcome, Dave Pinto. Thank you all. So so delighted to be here with with all of you again uh, this morning. Um, I want to um, uh, direct your attention, if I can, as I always do, to the back of the agenda, um, which describes the purposes for uh, what we're attempting to accomplish here together uh, each quarter that we've had these since uh, since Elders for Infants and I um, founded these initially and then joined with our partners um, at uh, University of St. Thomas um, School of Social Work and School of Education and then Senator Relf. Um, and to just point out that our purposes are to share plans, to establish a base of knowledge, and then to build relationships in a sense of camaraderie and, and, um, and a sense that we're all pushing in the same direction uh, when it comes to supporting the youngest kids. Uh, the focus today is very much on the plan sharing, as you'll see, uh, and on the, the session that is coming up. Um, hearing from uh, from the four caucuses, legislative caucuses from the administration and from uh, advocacy groups, um, and we hope to have some good conversation and engagement uh, on that as well. I do want to extend a special uh, uh, welcome to those folks who are joining us on the webcast, um, and in particular, we have some. I was at a, with Senator Ralph at a symposium this weekend with the National Conference of State Legislatures, uh, and their uh, prenatal the three staff said that they are regular watchers of our of our forum. So hello and greetings to you all, and thank you for the week that Senator Ralph and I spent with you. And um, uh, so with that, I will turn things over to Senator Ralph and then uh, get our conversations going. So Senator Ralph, thank you. Well, good morning. Hope everybody had a good night's sleep and was able to get here on time. I ran into a little traffic, that's why I was late. Uh, welcome. Uh, as I, as uh, Representative Pinto said, uh, we had an, a very enjoyable time in uh, San Antonio uh, going over some very interesting stuff uh, with a, at the univer uh, from the University of, uh, down there in Austin. And they're doing a, a, a research project to try and kind of identify various areas and then provide uh, of child care and, and early childhood development and provide some some research support which is going to be very useful going forward uh, and so the the people that presented down there were top-notch and it was a really good show so I uh, just I'll keep this brief uh, looks like we'll be running through uh, several of us uh, to talk about kind of the legislative priorities. I'm going to kind of take a 30,000 foot view without getting too deep into the weeds. Um, and then uh, we'll go from there. So thank you for coming and uh, enjoy the morning. Good morning. Happy to welcome you. This is our 14th, we believe, right? Uh, so this is our 14th forum. That's quite exciting, and thanks to all of our partners. Uh, this morning, we're going to be really looking ahead to what's, we're on the cusp of many things, and we're privileged to have representatives from the legislature here with us this morning. We're going to begin with senators, and we're, I think at this point, Senator Ralph, may we call you back up? 
You could have just stayed. That's all right. Now, I'm going to just flip this so that we'll just call it that. Okay. Well, as I said, I'm, I'm not going to do a, a real formal presentation here. I want to just kind of talk about the landscape a little bit and kind of where we'd like to see, or see ourselves going. Uh, and I'd, I'd, I'd like to turn back to some of the stuff that we talked about over the weekend. Um, and it seems that nationwide, things are pretty much the same in terms of uh, lack of access to good daycare, uh, housing issues, all kinds of things. So I think that one of the things that I took away from that and that I'm also going to be working on and actually have started working on in terms of the, uh, the ongoing legislation is, is about three areas. First of all, um, we do have an issue with our Department of Human Services and that unfortunately is the elephant in the room and trying to get things and, and working with the commissioner and their staff and trying to find out exactly what it we can do, what we can do about things such as the, the 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 apparent mishandling of some funds and then the problems we've had with CCAP and some of the other issues that we've had and I think we started last fall and when the commissioner took over and I, I give her a great deal of credit I wouldn't have stepped into that for anything uh, she took on a tough job and she's trying, I think, to make some progress. We had a hearing just last week or a couple weeks ago and got an update on some of the things that are going on. So I think that's something that I will be looking at from the Human Services Committee in the Senate to try to help provide whatever legislative support we can to the, to the reorganization and to, the, to, the, to going forward. Some specific things we want to look at are the... Um, uh, parent aware and some of the other programs that are intended to to bring quality to the daycare and at this point in time have some issues that we need to we need to sort of sort out infrastructure financing we had a bill that I was part of carried a couple years ago that kind of went by the wayside that was intended to provide some infrastructure for it was actually kind of an uh, innovative idea that we would take potentially provide capital for structures for daycare uh, and not necessarily centers and one of the ideas was especially in rural Minnesota there's a lot of buildings that would provide a place for people to carry on daycare have daycare facilities but they would be basically someone has a home facility but they'd just as soon get it somewhere out of the home that to try and bring those together and provide some uh, some revenue to do that and use the community foundations as a as kind of an overseer of that project, uh, there were some issues with uh, some of the qualifications. So we're we're going to revisit that. I know uh, the other parts of that I'm looking at right now. It, it, it in Minnesota, the average cost of daycare is over fifteen thousand dollars a year. Now, I don't know about you, but you start with two or three kids, and that, that, that becomes an impossible burden. So we're, we're going to have to look at that. One of the other things that I found is, is that we've lost over 3,000, closer to 3,200 family daycare facilities in Minnesota since 2010. And of the ones that left and of the ones that are contemplating leaving, nine out of 10 said that overregulation was a considerable contributing factor to their departure. Obviously, low wages or low return on their investment was another, and that's something I think we need to address. But that, that regulation area is very, very troublesome to me. Now, we started to do some stuff last year. We had some policy that uh, was implemented, and, and I've been talking with the county human Ser services commissioners from my, my area, uh, the five-county area around St. Cloud. And I've asked them if, if, if some of the changes we've made are helping, and they say, well, it's too soon to tell. So that's something I think we need to conti continue to monitor. And I think that I know that the, 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 I'm, uh, uh, Rep. DeMuth, DeMuth is, is very involved in that. So I think, I think this is something that we will be looking at again is to try and wor work on the regulations because we can't have quality daycare if we don't have daycare. And I, I just feel that, that, that it is a a critical part of the infrastructure is with the very early development we need to have those quality 
early childhood care facilities that provide the kind of stimulus and learning that we know helps that developing brain. So that's going to be a priority in my area. So with that, uh, I believe, Melissa, are you up? Senator Wicklum? Good morning. I'm um, State Senator Melissa Wickland, and I represent Bloomington Richfield area. Uh, I'm pleased to be here this morning. Let me see if I can operate this correctly. Great. And um, I put together just a couple slides, and I, I was going to speak just uh, very high level about um, caucus priorities. Uh, this session uh, will be starting in just uh, two weeks. Um, and Certainly, uh, I think a couple topics that'll be um, on top of minds of all of us in the legislature will be um, uh, looking at the budget surplus and what does that mean for um, our session. Um, I think we need to do uh, get some feedback and analysis from uh, staff on you know what uh, do we have to work with, uh, what programs. Um, we'll be needing funding in the out years that we um, need to plan for, um, and then um, is there any one-time money that would be available to be um, utilized this year to spend on uh, programs or um, activities? Um, so that will take up, I think, time um, for us early in the session to try and figure that out, um, to see if there will be the possibility of a supplemental budget this year, uh, bill this year, and um, then certainly bonding, um, the bonding priorities and bonding um, projects. Uh, we've been, the Senate has been making tours around the state and putting together a bonding um, bill certainly will be a priority for um, those of us, you know, both parties will be looking at ways to get um, uh, good programs and good projects funded. Um, in terms of working family issues, um, I hope that we are able to do some work to address, um, as Senator Ralph mentioned, child care. Um, it's certainly a huge issue for families in the state, both cost and um, availability and quality. And so uh, what we whatever we can do, um, hopefully, to address all of those things that would be um, important. Um, paid leave is another area that we're certainly advocating for, both for, for parents to take care of family members, both um, children and, and adults. Um, that would be something that we would like to continue advocating for. Um, in terms of health care, um, you know, there's certainly a lot of discussion about affordability of um, access to health care, affordability of prescription drugs. Um, hopefully we will be able to, to talk about ways that we as a state can have an impact on affordability of, of health care and, and policy issues that might um, help us there. Um, certainly children having access to um, health care is really important and um, want to look at ways that um, any upcoming changes in, in federal uh, policy affect our state and how we can maintain um, children's access to um, medical programs. Um, that, that is a really important um, issue for me. Um, in terms of education, uh, we've heard a lot from school districts around the state that they um, have not been able to continue programs and they've had to make um, budget cuts um, due to the funding levels not being um, adequate. So uh, I think you know we're going to look at ways that we could um, maybe address particular program shortfalls. Um, I don't know that we'll be able to do much this year, not being a budget year, but certainly looking at um, additional funds for specific programs that might have an impact. Um, on, on schools would be appropriate. Um, you know, we, we know that um, every, every child is, deserves a, a world-class education. Um, we need to have uh, kids attending schools where they, where they feel safe and nurtured. Um, and so looking for ways that we can make a difference in, in our school environments and um, also, you know, how do we make sure that, that all students have access to um, caring and professional or qualified teachers? Um, and I think 
that what we can do, if we can do anything to encourage um, the profession, to strengthen the profession um, from preschool, um, from childcare, um, you know, all the way up through, through the K-12 system, I think is really important that we do address if we can. Um, and then in terms of my own personal just things that I'm working on. Um, I am a member of the Family Child Care Task Force, and I know that that's going to be discussed later. Um, I hope that if we do have recommendations that come forward um, from that, that we can work on those in the legislature if there are policy changes that we can make. Um, we've had good meetings so far, and, and I hope that there are some tactical things that we can do in the legislature this session. Um, other areas I'm working on, health and human services areas, um, if there are child care policy changes that we can work on, I'd like to move those forward. And then I'm part of the Blue Ribbon Council on Information Technology, and we have some recommendations that we're um, that we've put together in reports, and I'd like to see some of those um, acted on this session as well. So um, it should be a busy time, and I know it'll go fast, um, and it it'll, we'll, hopefully we'll have some good things to show for it. Thanks. Okay, so you've heard from the majority in the Senate, the, min the minority in the Senate, uh, then you're going to hear from the majority in the House, and then afterwards the, min the minority in the House. Let's just kind of make sure we're all, we're all oriented here. Um, and uh, so um, a lot of our work in the, in the House is um, being connected to and driven by our early childhood um, committee, which I, which I chair. I want to make sure that we're all just um, first reminded and oriented um, and, and somehow with all the different formats of presentations, Senator Wicklin and I ended up having the same formats. So it's good, good. We, have, we share good taste um, there. So just a reminder that, um, that this, is, uh, this is our vision and some of our first, uh, first set of bills um, is this connection between um, uh, prenatal care and then making sure the parents have the time and the opportunity to spend time with their kids and build that, um, that critical relationship in critical years. And then home visiting, early care and learning all the way on up. And this, in our view, is, um, is a connected set of policies. And so this will continue to drive um, our work on this coming session and, and really beyond um, as well. Um, what we expect um, to be focusing on, um, to really be focusing on quite a bit is, um, is still the same basic framework um, contained in House File 1, um, boosting home visiting, which we know um, has such an impact uh, on families and on communities. Um, we uh, continue to support um, early learning scholarships focused on birth to three, the most critical years. Uh, we know from the, the curve popularized by, um, by James Heckman um, that, uh, that it's those uh, prenatal uh, that prenatal time is most important, and then those first weeks and months, and that's where we need to focus uh, our efforts. Um, and a CCAP, um, ensuring, of course, that there's federal conformity. And for those folks in the room who are not aware, um, right now our rates are so low um, that they are out of uh, compliance with federal requirements. And... Um, and uh, we actually are, are facing the possibility of a significant penalty for that, uh, which I will say, as bad as that penalty is, it pales in comparison with the penalty of not adequately paying um, providers. Um, uh, and we have such low rates uh, right now based on a survey from 2011. So increasing those rates, um, getting kids uh, off the waiting list and, and, uh, and getting access to care. Um, in the meantime, while this is outside of the age three uh, area, we want to make sure um, that the 4,000 uh, four-year-olds who are um, uh, receiving services in, in, in pre-kindergarten uh, are continuing to able, be able to do so. And so um, uh, keeping access to, to pre-K um, for those kids who are right now. And then grants and loans for providers. And we had a small set of grants for, uh, for DEED, uh, Department of, of Employment Economic Development, and through the Minnesota Initiative Foundations around the state. We want to expand that. And there's a number of other approaches as well. There's a program called Retain um, to keep providers in the workforce, et cetera. In addition, um, we certainly are interested in the, the work of the Family Child Care Task Force. Um, we actually have three of the four legislator members, in fact, in the room here. You've heard from two of them. And um, uh, the co-chair, um, Representative Wazlewick, will be talking later. Because um, there is a need, as, as Senator Ralph said, and we certainly need to make sure the regulations um, are working well um, for providers. I may disagree a little bit on to what extent that is causing uh, providers to be exiting the um, 
uh, uh, are causing this, the, the market to not work. We'll talk about that in Q&A, but we certainly need to address it. Um, in our view, there's a need to evaluate how well parent aware um, is working, and, uh, and we would like to, to move forward on that. Readiness assessment for kindergarten, um, and certainly reviewing how, um, how the CCAP program is working. There have been some, some really, I think, very impressive reforms that the department has undertaken, and we want to um, uh, make sure to take a look at those and, and, um, and see how they're working. I do want to just highlight, because I want to make sure I didn't forget, on, uh, so we've had a series of joint hearings with other committees in the Early Childhood Committee, including two with the Jobs and Economic Development um, Committee, pointing out that uh, early care and learning is a short-term economic development tool, because it gets parents to work and supports businesses, and it's a long-term economic development tool, of course, as well. So we had a couple hearings in St. Cloud and Winona. Next Monday, we're going to have a hearing with the Corrections Committee, um, uh, because we know that having an incarcerated parent is an adverse childhood experience. It's an ACE. And there's uh, a critical intersection between early childhood issues and corrections issues as well. So if you're um, able to join us, we'd certainly um, be really glad to um, uh, glad to have you. Uh, so we have, and then I want to make sure to point out that, of course, we're going to continue the push for paid leave. Um, we're certainly going to continue the push for those other pieces that I had mentioned that I had mentioned before. I think that that yep. That's, that's that. So um, we've had this um, really a strong leader in her first term on early childhood issues serving on our committee. I've been really pleased to have her. And so I'm going to transition to that person, Representative Lisa Damoth. So let's welcome her. But first, but first, a word from our sponsors. No, I just want to mention that on your tables, there are uh, three by five cards. And if we, we will have Q&A, and if you would ad address them to, if you would, or it may be for everybody. But I just want to interrupt this for this important announcement. Okay, now, thank you. Good morning. I am Representative Lisa Damoth. Happy to be here with you this morning. Um, I serve District 13A, which is in greater Minnesota, just west of St. Cloud. I have the communities of Cold Spring, Rockville, Richmond, St. Joe, Avon, Painesville, a little of Eden Valley, a little of Watkins, and Kimball, all of those surrounding townships. We do face unique challenges in our area when it comes to child care specifically, um, but also in our workforce, and those two go hand in hand. It is a pleasure to be here. My background is on the Recori School Board where I served for 11 years and I saw firsthand how healthy communities um, benefit from healthy families and healthy communities also help our families to be healthier and stronger. Some of the things that we are looking forward to this year as we go back into session in two weeks is looking at the uh, the early learning scholarships, we know that those give us a good return on investment for our littlest Minnesotans, and we want to make sure that we can maintain or even expand those. That helps us uh, give parents and families the unique flexibility that they may need. We also want to be protecting the integrity of our child care industry by preventing fraud. That has been mentioned already this morning. We want to make sure that we are, are um, enhancing our program controls we're uh, aiding in investigations and prosecutions and then also reforms and eligibility. We want to make sure those dollars are going directly to the families that most need those benefits. Part of uh, helping with the fraud area is creating an independent OIG separate from DHS. It's something that's been talked about. We would like to explore that further. And then also I am a part of the Family Child Care Task Force, happy to be serving in that area. Great work is being done, and we want to make sure that we are expanding options to best meet the needs of families. In my area specifically, family child care can also be a help because of our distance that is covered. Uh, and so also part of um, working with the family child care and on that task force, we're looking at how we can help providers that are choosing to be in that industry benefit and give the best care to those littlest Minnesotans. I've heard from people in my community, um, grandparents actually, that were surprised when they were expecting their first grandchild, that their children had to actually hold a spot by paying monthly for the child care for that new baby, five to seven months early to be able to secure that spot with no refund on that money or any, any discount coming forward. That was a surprise out in our area. It's not unique. I've also heard of grandparents that are choosing to retire early to help out. And if families can do that, that's great, but we need to make sure that we're making it available for all families. Again, thank you. It's very good to be here, and I look forward to learning more this morning.
And now we're going to hear from the administration. Oh, that's okay. I'm sorry, I'm going the wrong way. All right. Well, there we are. Thank Thanks, you. Welcome, James. Stephanie. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Um, Era Johnson sends her regrets, but I will cover um, our piece um, for her. There we go. Um, so just, I wanna talk a little bit about a preview of the session as well as a quick uh, summary of some work that's been underway with the Children's Cabinet directly, looking specifically looking forward to 2021. Um, but as you likely have seen, the um, Governor Walls and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan have released their uh, bonding proposals, which have included significant investment in affordable housing, much of which will impact children and families, as well as um, an increase to our the early childhood facilities grants that DHS runs that help to construct and renovate early childhood facilities so that they're safe as well as to increase um, access to early childhood um, education services and uh, childcare programs. And that's a total of 10 million, 5 million in general obligation bonds and 5 million in general fund cash. These um, grants do require a 50% local match. Um, and then uh, the governor's budget, of course, uh, can't say too much about that today, but we're paying attention to a lot of the issues that were previously discussed. Um, I am also a member of the Family Child Care Task Force um, as, the governor, as the Children's Cabinet appointee, as well as looking at a lot of the issues related to um, comprehensive early childhood um, concerns that were mentioned. So that'll be released after the February forecast. Um, there's a lot of work within the state agencies underway around um, early childhood. Of course, many of you are familiar with the preschool development grant, and you'll hear a little bit more about that today, and additional um, work in agencies that are looking at um, what administrative levers can be done to increase access to childcare to promote healthy development. Um, specifically within the, our children's cabinet update, I wanted to give you a little update on work underway in our action teams. Um, some of you may have heard we're undertaking a pretty broad scale fiscal mapping effort on children and families with a particular eye toward uh, building a budget on 20, in 2021 that has a particular focus on children and families. Oop, going the wrong way there. Um, so first, many of you know about our five priority areas, so I won't go expand extensively on those, but um, healthy beginnings, our population level outcome goal is to end preventable infant and maternal deaths, and you'll see a little star by each of our priority areas that have a specific measurable goal um, for young children and families. Obviously, healthy beginnings is focused on young children and families with a particular eye toward um, African-American and American Indian children and families um, having a safe beginning in life. Um, our child care and early education action team, um, this is around creating um, access to child care so business and community can thrive, and that is through a mixed delivery system. We will have measurable goals around increasing or maintaining family child care slots as well as increasing the number of child care centers with a focus on underserved areas thanks to extensive data and research by the results team at MMB and the University of Minnesota. Couple pieces underway with that. We are looking at how to better align um, regulations across uh, the agencies that regulate child care providers. The fire marshal, which is the uh, Department of Public Safety, DHS, um, MDH, and there's actually a a uh, request for some pro bono work by a private sector to kind of evaluate that process and that cross-agency process that was just published recently to help get us some recommendations about how we can better align that work. Um, so we're really excited about some of the work underway in the Child Care Action Team. Mental health and well-being is focused more on um, student mental health, but we have uh, incorporated some ideas around early childhood mental health and we will, um, in creating our action plans, be thinking around the student survey, but um, we are connected to some of the work within agencies around early childhood mental health. As you know, for our housing stability goal, we are doubling down on the interagency Council on Homelessness goal to end um, family and child homelessness. And we will have very specific measurable goals where, uh, for children under age one and young children and families, knowing that um, the impact on child development um, on, with homelessness is very significant at those ages. 
Um, and then with educational opportunity, we added this fifth priority area. It's not in the executive order. Some of you may have heard that. Um, but we were, we're looking at a cross-agency approach to educational opportunity, and there will, that will include early childhood uh, educational goals as well. Um, so we've, um, a lot of the work underway right now is developing action plans that have administrative levers and legislative levers to drive toward these measurable goals that um, eventually will be uh, released publicly and will be more specific. These are the population level goals. And then really quick, quick summary of our fiscal mapping effort. Other states, this is a snapshot of New, Me New Mexico's fiscal mapping effort. Other states have embarked in collecting data on how resources are spent on children and families across state agencies by outcome and service model. And so we, a couple weeks ago, tasked all 22 children's cabinet agencies with sending us within the realm of specific parameters data and information on the resources that they spend on children and families with a focus on children zero to 18. Um, and that's federal and state dollars is what we're looking at right now. And other states have really used this data to identify gaps in funding when a, a funding stream is ending or a grant is ending, how can we make that work sustainable if it's working? Um, also provide relevant uh, cross agency information on how we're spending our dollars to look at our budget in more, a more holistic way and how it's serving children and families. Um, and so we'll be using this data in our action teams to inform action plans and administrative levers, what funding streams are flexible to, that we can adapt to start investing and meeting our goals around children and families. And then um, we're, we're working with our cross-agency teams to identify opportunities for new or enhanced cross-agency coordination. And then we're really going to leverage this information toward a 2021 budget that um, prioritizes children and families. And I want to reiterate, too, I don't think I explicitly said the fiscal map will result in a public-facing report and tool that um, will be available for all of you to use in, in your efforts to better understand how state and federal resources are being spent on children and families in Minnesota. This is a huge undertaking and um, we're grateful for a partnership with the MMB's budget division to execute it as well as the work happening in the state agencies. Um, so that's my quick summary. Sorry I went a little bit over, but look forward to chatting more. So as our uh, legislative and administrative team comes forward to the table, if you have a card with a question, just raise your hand and uh, the elders are among us and, and others to pick things up and bring them up. Um, we are running a little bit ahead of schedule, so you know we, you can continue to add questions. We'll, we'll go until uh, about... 10:15, and then we have kind of a special break today that we'll talk about. Somehow, four politicians were got ahead of schedule and, and said I, less. It's amazing. Shocker. We we run a tight ship here, so um, this question does not have a name to it. So maybe you can people can jump in regarding workforce recruitment and retention for the early childhood field. Has there been exploration of providing health insurance? either free or greatly reduced to those in the workforce who meet income requirements to help with retention. So this is um, maybe, again, it sounds like it could be a family child care task force, but it could be broader than that. But does anybody want to take that question? You want me to repeat it? Uh, no, need, no need to repeat it from, I think we all, we all got it. Get I, it. I will just say, I, um, I've heard of that idea um, mentioned maybe briefly once, but I think I'm so glad that it's been brought up again now because I do think it makes a lot of sense. But I will say, uh, I, think, I think we should make sure everybody has health insurance, um, which is maybe a different, a different point. Um, but, uh, but I think that that makes a lot of sense. Um, and, uh, and so I'd say, uh, whoever brought that up, please um, come chat with me and let's, uh, let's work on it. But I'll see what my colleagues think as well. Okay, wasn't sure this was working. I, you know, this is something that's been kicked around a little bit. Um, 
I'm not sure what form it would take, but it's certainly, I think, a, a way of enhancing uh, getting people into the field. I think that because of the, the low remuneration that we, that the, especially the family care providers receive, uh, and in many cases, there's, there's someone we're in the home besides the provider, and, and a lot of times that's where their health insurance comes from. But in some cases, that's not, not, so, not so true. So I think it's something we definitely should look at exactly what form and how we would uh, stimulate that this would be a good private-public partnership that we should look into, and I think it's a good way to leverage dollars. Um, yeah, I'd, I've heard of other models used outside of Minnesota where um, common services are provided by some kind of a community organization, and I think health care would be, or health insurance would be, um, one of those things that could be helpful, especially uh, for family care providers, and I hope that that's something that we can look into, um, that along with other business services that family care providers um, have to deal with, uh, which makes the, the role um, really incredibly difficult when you're not um, making a lot of money at it. And so I think if we could offer a way for people to buy into a health insurance program, um, I think that would really be attractive to, to providers and helpful. So I hope we can explore that. Um, I know that it has been talked about just briefly, but one of the things that we need to keep in mind is finding out how many um, providers that has either taken out of that family child care market or is that a drawback for somebody entering too. So whether that is in a survey or continued with a uh, Family Child Care Task Force. It's something that we need to identify if that is a definite roadblock, but it is something very important to consider. Hey, Jane, I, I might just notice, note in this, this feels like a good time to note, that a very significant percentage of child care workers are on public assistance programs in some form. So just sort of we're talking about people at the very, people doing the most important work in society and receiving the lowest compensation because the economics just don't work when you, when you, when you do the math on it. All right, thanks. And if I can really quickly make, I meant to say this in my presentation, but to Representative DeMoose, the point about surveying providers, um, the Family Child Care Task Force has drafted a survey and through, um, at the last meeting, it was approved that the results team through our child care action team will administer a survey to family child care providers. And there are some questions um, related to why family child care providers are leaving um, the, the field kind of related to personal reasons. I can't remember specifically if healthcare is one of them, but um, as I review the survey, I think next week before it goes out, I'll keep this question in mind. I know it's come up. Just, just one, just to, to put in uh, some inf uh, information. I know the, at least the five county area where I, uh, where I work in, uh, the, the um, human services directors do have an exit interview survey that they take when people leave the, leave the profession. And I, you might want to find out if other counties do the same thing, and I think that would be a very valuable source of information because this is coming straight from, so to speak, the horse's mouth. They're telling you why they're leaving, and, and most of them are pretty frank about it. So that's something you should be looking into. That was a, actually a, a, maybe a good segue here because there was a question specifically for you about who is giving the information on the regulations. And then it's common, we did, we, and I'm not sure who the we is in this, but we did exit interviews of child care providers leaving the field. The regulations came up only as often as wages and benefits as, as the value of child care in the field. And if child care providers were paid more, regulations would, wouldn't seem so burdensome. So it's kind of a chicken egg thing. So it'll be that, again, this is from the card, so. Okay, Ch uh, counties have the option to pass, this is maybe for everybody, have a half cent, pa counties have the option to pass a half cent sales tax to support transit projects. What are your thoughts about allowing counties or cities a similar dedicated revenue source for early childhood development education? And you can, uh, what, can we give it maybe um, a five if you think it's great, or just give me a number? I mean, I think it's, I, I kind of don't want to, I, I just want to get a sense of your well, feeling about well, I'll just, that. Well, I, I guess I'll just say, like, we, um, we as a society have to value this with the importance it actually has. So my general sense is we need to be putting, we need to be investing in this area, 
and we seem not to be willing to do so in various other ways. So in general, my feeling is that we need to raise the revenue necessary or have the revenue necessary to, to do it. Um, now, I'll point out that different forms of revenue raising have different impact, fiscal impacts, right? And so, um, so you know, any one particular thing, I, I think there's some advantages, disadvantages. But the basic point that we have to have this be a top priority and funded accordingly, n not just for the sake of the people, but for the sake of all of us, um, I guess that's, you know, that's my general thought. So regarding this specifically, I can see some advantages and disadvantages, um, but in general, if we're not, we need to allow communities to move forward if we as a state and we as a country are not. Um, I'm gonna take middle on that idea. Um, I don't know if that is the direct way that we should be looking at it, but I do value the need for childcare and making sure that our providers have what they need to be able to do their work in their field. Um, there's other ways that we could look at it. It could be tax incentives or tax benefits to employers. It could be something, uh, tax breaks for those that are actually providing the care, but it is something that we need to explore in a varied way of looking at it and coming out what would be best for all Minnesotans. <laughs> I'll kind of take the same approach, and, and, and there's a couple of reasons behind this. As, as Representative Pinto said, uh, one, of the, one of the topics, in fact, that, uh, in our forum that over the weekend was taxes as applied to raising revenue for early childhood. Uh, one of the things that I think comes out pretty, pretty clearly is that while sales taxes are easy, they're also re regressive. And you have to be careful how, where you apply them and what they are because they tend to hit lower income people harder than higher income. So that, that's one of, the, one of the disadvantages that you see with sales taxes. Um, I think that we have to take a, a, a different look and that is, I kind of look at it from a, a little bit higher elevation. I look at the total spending that the state engages in per, per capita and it's, the, it's either ninth or tenth highest in the country. Now, that, that tells me something. We, are, we do have enough money here. It's just, are we spending it efficiently? And I think there's a lot of things that we can do if we focus on things that are really important, that we can find ways to, to, to be more efficient and then put those savings into the areas that we want to do. So I'm kind of an all of the above approach. Thank you. I guess I'll just add that I, I think it's worth exploring. I think that different options have um, different political um, impacts and they need to be explored. I think, as Representative Pino said, I think we aren't investing enough. Um, I think we need to determine you know, how much we should be investing and figure out what are the, the ways that we can accomplish investing that the funds. Um, this could be one of the ways, and, and there's, there's probably other ways that would be good as well. Thank you. Go ahead, Stephanie. If I, I, just, I just want to note, uh, if folks have a particular interest in financing early childhood and, and that aspect of things, as Senator Ralph re referenced, there was a presentation at the symposium they were, that we were at, and there's a, a new report called, uh, called Funding Our Future, I think is what it's called, that talked about a number of the different approaches, including, for example, tying... Um, uh, a state tax uh, to uh, early childhood spending, which if you think has a lot of logic to it, um, uh, right, in terms of uh, uh, cycles of poverty and cycles of wealth. Um, and so if folks have a particular interest in that, I would direct you to that report and happy to talk with you and, and connect you with it. Because it's clearly something that those of us as early childhood advocates need to be thinking about um, is, that, is that revenue piece. Again, I, I think the whole rest of the budget should figure out, should, I mean, this should be the very top priority, but as long as we're gonna have to advocate for it, um, this is something we should be thinking about. Just two quick things that I will add is the, I wouldn't disregard that point of local revenue, but also in thinking about our disparities and how we address investments, we have to think on a statewide level too, because sometimes when local initiatives uh, in certain communities, that's more possible than in other communities. And the other thing I'll add is the Department of Revenue sits on our child care action team and we're thinking about um, and looking at what other states and localities have done to inform how do we fund a system that obviously there's a lot of levers at play, pay, um, yeah, people actually having access to jobs and the child care actual cost itself, it demands uh, an economic and investment at the state or local level. And so how can we 
make that investment in a wise, wise way uh, to address kind of the needs of populations across the state. So to build on that, there, I have several cards on uh, fiscal mapping, okay? Yeah. And so the, uh, the big theme of, of that is will the fiscal mapping differentiate spending by age? Or at least I, I would see kind of this question of how is prenatal to three spelled out or is it in the fiscal mapping? The information that we're collecting does include for all the program line items does include if there are ages, age requirements or um, data broken down by different population categories as available. So if, if uh, you know, the line for early learning scholarships could include data by race and ethnicity and it will say this serves, um, you know, four and five year olds in this category, zero to three year olds in this category. So we will have that information. Now, what will be public facing will be a little bit more simplistic, but we'll be able to kind of evaluate it in a way that um, looks at age and um, age span, mm -hmm. zero to 18. Okay. I think the, uh, with this comment or with another comment was, um, there is more money spent on K-12 than in East in early childhood. So we, I think kind of a zero to 18 window is big. Zero to five is kind of what the message is from here, or zero to three. So I just, I draw that out and then. Oh, just, hey Jane, can yep. I just comment on that? I just, I yep. think it's really important we all have in mind just the image of the Heckman curve where it's the highest impact prenatal and it goes down pretty fast, down to even age four or five and then down beyond there. And then our spending is the exact opposite of that. Uh, we spend the least when it matters the most. And so just we need to keep that in mind constantly. Um, yeah. and, uh, and if you imagine tr that families trying to educate their kids um, between ages 5 and 18, uh, and that that would not work real well, then we have to pay that. It's the same thing as ages 0 to 5, except that the impact is that much more. And, of course, the ratio is that much more challenging because you're not going to have 20 infants in a, in a classroom. Yeah. Um, again, one more fiscal map. Will you be tracking federal dollars going straight to local government agencies or only federal money passing through the state? For the purpose of this exercise, only federal dollars going through the state. This is something people have asked a lot about, um, mm -hmm. but you know, for the scope and parameters of this exercise, we had to have some limitations. Yeah. It would be, yeah, it'd be a long, a long haul. Okay. Um, in the children's cabinet work, what is the understanding of when and at what age does education begin? So the way that we talk about our children is from prenatal to prefrontal cortex development. So okay. um, <laughs> while I, I know the previous administration had a, an intensive focus on early childhood, we still have that focus, but we're also looking at children up to uh, when they're out of um, developmental stage and off ready to have uh, build their own families, too. Yeah, so. until 26, they say. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So. That's not months. If I, can I interject All on right. that? All right. <laughs> Can I interject on that also? Sure. Um, and I'm a mom of four, and all mine, I have one left that's not quite 26, and I, I agree. <laughs> I, I agree with that. Hopefully they will never know about this part. Um, I also sit on the P20 um, Education and Partnership partnership task force. And so that, um, the focus, and we did have a meeting last week, um, we're just kind of getting a restart on that. I've only attended two of the meetings so far, um, but there's some new leadership in there. One of the things that is looking how we can get our students ready for the workforce or college or um, career and technical education, whatever that is, we are also taking a look because of the P in the name of that, that preschool. Um, it's not to be slighted. And so I'm really honored to be on both of those task forces mm -hmm. and task force. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, but I am honored to be on both of those and I can see how they work together. And so I think that is also to say the importance of what we are doing here this morning, bringing this into the focus, our earliest learners matter and how they transition later. And so I can see where those, those partnerships will definitely work together. And, and to build on something you mentioned earlier about grandparent care, we had a question online and also one from the audience, but I just want to highlight that people can send in questions who are in our listening audience, viewing audience. Um, 
Grandparents are a piece of family, friend, and neighbor care, as we call it. FFN used to be called kith and kin. And they are a primary source of care for many infants and toddlers as either supplement and sometimes the primary. So is there or are there any proposed policy funding or other resources that are mentioned this morning that might be considered as support or for training or resources uh, for family, friend, and neighbor providers. And as I say, this is a, this is one of those, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, interestingly, uh, this is something that I have felt for quite some time as an area we need to look at. Uh, and the reason I say this is because it comes from a broader inquiry and that's where we have people providing, family, you know, kit and kin providing services not only to kids, but also to take care of elder uh, mm -hmm. people. Uh, and, I, and I think back to a different era uh, when families did take a, a, a greater share of the responsibility. And I, I'm not sure whether society, just because of the way we our society is set up today, but back in the day, I can remember my uh, sister-in-law taking care of both her parents and her husband's parents. Uh, basically moved in at, in the last days of the lives. So, I mean, my point being that I think we do need to not ignore that segment in terms of our policy mm -hmm. and finding ways to support, encourage, or even economically reward some of that. And I'm thinking of even things as innovative as tax credits for people who do provide this kind of work. Uh, so I think it's an area that w we, we have a, a tremendous opportunity to... Uh, expand that segment. I think regulations fail to take into account that sometimes a family member can be an excellent provider. I know some of the regulations surrounding family members in a family daycare situation are pretty restrictive. And I think that some, th those are places I think we can look at that, that we need to think outside the box. And this is one area that I think is, is a possible one. I know I hear comments all the time about uh, in fact, I think I heard about this group, the, uh, the Elders for Infants, the comment was made that, gee, so many of them aren't able to attend because they're taking care of their grandkids. <laughs> right. yeah. And I, I think this is something we really need to think about, yeah. that there is, there is a workforce there that in, in many cases wants to help, wants to do something. And I think, I'm not sure, uh, this is way outside the box, but I'm not sure exactly what we as, a, as policymakers can do to enhance that. Dave. Yeah, and I, and I would just really encourage folks, because I agree that it's, it's critical, I and mean, a huge proportion of care is being provided by family, friend, and neighbor. And I, I feel like, um, but I really would encourage folks who are interested in that area, um, you know, we want to hear your ideas. So I've been, the, our, um, uh, our committee started in January of 2019. I guess I've been working, we've been doing this for a number of years, right? And I, I'm really not aware of many, if, uh, if any, specific policy ideas. I feel like we've raised the issue of family, friend, and neighbor a lot, but then mm -hmm. as far as anybody saying we should do X, um, I'll admit I, I'm looking for that X. So um, if you have that, please reach out to us, because um, mm -hmm. I think none of us would dispute the importance of that kind of care, um, but, uh, uh, but don't necessarily look to us for the ideas. We want to, this is part of the point of, of us all getting together. Mm -hmm. So we have, and, and many times, as we talk about access, it's access is affordability, proximity, and relevance. Those are the things that go into it. And I think that family, friend, and neighbor is one of those options in the mixed delivery, but the, the other being with the cost and also the low wages with so much turnover, we, we really struggle with that social-emotional development, which is the other piece of mental health. That again, I would just say, as you're looking into the mental health world, that that formulation of of that early attachment and beyond is has to be there. So we've got. Um, I'm going to just. I've got several questions. We've got about 15 more minutes. I'm going to read a few of these. Senator Wickland, um, are there any plans to review? review and augment the current immunization laws in Minnesota, particularly to childhood immunizations? Well, I, I know that there have been discussions about that, and I think two or three years ago, we, um, the Senate DFL, we, we had a bill to, to make some changes to 
um, encourage more, um, I guess I'd say like parent involvement and, and physician involvement and accountability for uh, people who are choosing to not, you know, participate in as many vaccinations. Um, I don't know of anything specific that will happen this year. Um, I think it's something we do need to talk about, though, because um, as we hear about measles outbreaks and um, things going on around the country, we know that that has happened here and, and could again. And so um, I think we need to reflect on what, what can we do to strengthen um, strengthen our, our vaccination approach. And in the Senate, I, you know, we'll be thinking about it, but I, I don't foresee that actually coming up um, because I don't have control over that right now, but Senator okay. Ralph can comment on whether that would be something discussed this year. All right, well, it's, it's on the, it's, we'll, we'll just put it out there as a question. And do you want, do you want to add? Okay. Um, Representative Pinto, do you want to say more about the kindergarten readiness assessment, if you would, please? Sure, yeah. So, um, so we're currently spending about $280,000 uh, per year on, um, uh, on a voluntary um, uh, program for districts. And I, I, may, I, I know there's people in the room who know, this, know this, uh, these details better than I do. But, but uh, a voluntary program for districts um, to be able to... Um, uh, assess uh, assess what it says, the readiness of kids uh, for kindergarten and, and attempt to get a sense as to how their preparation is and, and um, uh, the programs that they went through before. So, so what the proposal is, is to have that be something that is much more institutionalized and, um, and, uh, and supported. Um, uh, cause, uh, and so essentially it would increase that 280,000 that we're spending right now to be um, roughly about two million, but then we have a sense as to how well prepared our children as they're um, as they're coming to kindergarten, and in particular linking to um, the programs that they were in in the years leading up to that in these in these first years. So uh, we view this as being a real um, opportunity to make sure that we have um, uh, have that sense as to how well kids are being prepared in those first few years. If my colleagues want to add anything to that, I feel like I missed something. Okay. Okay. Um, question about um, what, where do you see the role of parent education, uh, early childhood family ed, um, supporting parents as they are raising their children? We, we have a question about encouraging early home reading, um, encouraging, you know, various things. And so I just was curious if, if any of you want to touch on that. I know we are very concerned about child care as a parent support, but there's also the parent support piece. So I'd just like to hear from any of you. Because of the work. Because of the work that I did um, when I served on my local school board, I understood the importance of that early childhood family education that was provided through our community ed. And we had a number of families that took um, advantage of that programming. And there was a sliding fee for the cost or, you know, there was help available that way. One of the challenges that we found was finding uh, parent educators. We didn't have enough of those in our area at the right, um, the right times. There were families that were working that maybe wanted to access that information in the, in the evenings. And so there were challenges with it, but it is very valued. Um, we need, with the amount that we spend on education, which was talked about earlier, we need to look at how we can be providing that education all the way from birth all the way through our oldest population, through community ed is a really great way to do it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, just again, uh, I hate to keep referring back to this weekend, but it was, it was loaded. And uh, this was one of the things that did come up in terms of more policy. Uh, one of the things that we focused on was providing through home visiting and through other uh, agency participation in education, especially of young mothers who we're going to have to parent. And, and doing some, some real focusing on the, the importance of educating young parents as to the care and, care and feeding of their kids, so to speak. The kids don't come with an instruction book. And there was a fair amount of discussion, I would say, wouldn't you, Dave, around that issue of how in the programs we can build in especially for the low-income and minority uh, families, uh, and especially for families who, who have two working parents, and 
how you can provide them with resources and supports to, to encourage and help them with how they deal with their young, very young children, especially reading to them. Just, one of them was just singing to them. I remember one of the comments was, teach the parents, tell them, singing to your kids is a good thing. So this is something that we are looking into, I think, as a policy matter. And so I, that was, that, I think, in answer to that question. And, and Jane, let me quickly, and just let me quickly add for those, this working? Yes, okay. Yeah. Um, for those um, not aware that ECFE, Early Childhood Family Education, really is this uniquely Minnesota um, program, which is, um, I think, known throughout the country, and just, just does amazing work. And so that's wonderful. And also to put a plug in for home visiting, because that really, uh, there's a component of that that is about parent education, as Senator Ralph referenced. So yeah, really important. Thanks. Okay, then we have a couple of, these are, as I call them environmental, but experiential issues. Overuse of screens is becoming a serious issue for kids of all ages. The latest research is confirming screens are changing the white matter of, not, I don't know if it's a gray, it's probably not the gray matter, but the white matter in the young child's brain, reducing their executive function skills. As a state, how can we educate parents and caregivers about screen time and about its impact on young children? So I will put a plug in for, I think the Representative Kelly Morrison uh, is going to have a bill um, uh, to, um, to take a look at this and to really make sure that we are educating parents. I think there's two components to screen time. One is the screen in front of the child's eyes. And I think, I believe the American Academy of Pediatrics says there should be nothing before age two um, and obviously limited after that. Um, but then the other piece is the parent being distracted by the screen um, because, of course, we know that that's a, that attachment, that serve, um, serve and return, um, and, uh, and so both of those are, are major concerns. Okay, I'm gonna keep us moving then. Um, maintaining healthy homes free of lead poisoning and asthma triggers helps kids attend and do well in school, helps parents go to work, and um, reduces their, uh, anyway, healthcare costs. Please talk about what the legislature or governor's office can do to support healthy homes for kids. I'll quickly speak to, we have been uh, pulled together a group of Department of Health and Commerce and people who work on um, the asthma home visiting programs as well as the lead uh, abatement programs. And then there's other programs that go into homes, so the weatherization assistance program. So we've uh, convened um, only once, but we're, hoping, we're looking forward to convening them more to look at how they can coordinate their services. And there's lots of, they're doing a lot of good work already in coordination, um, and there's some local models, particularly in Minneapolis, um, that some of you may be familiar with doing this work. So there are legislative ways to approach this, and I know there's been some um, proposals, but there's also uh, ad administrative ways. Okay. Um, we have a question about special uh, children in special needs that they're getting identified more uh, earlier, and um, how will funding these federally mandated services be increased to prevent kind of a growing... Um, I'm, this says cross-subsidy for school districts. That means something to people. Yeah. I guess uh, this is probably one of my most passionate areas is the early identification of, of disabilities and providing supports because the sooner you intervene, the fur further upstream you get, the better the results are at the other end. And so I think this is something we need to seriously look at. I, I, while I know there's people who have some troubles with home visiting, I think it's an important uh, component. If you have someone in the home early that can recognize a learning disability, a des uh, developmental disability, a physical disability, and then, and here's the real crux of it, and you've, you've heard my, me pound this drum before, share the data. Make sure that we have the right agencies getting the data to help bring the supports to the child rather than the, or the parents and the child rather than them having to search for it. Because I think that the, the, more, the, the more efficient we can be in that delivery, first of all, it's gonna save us money in two ways. Number one, the administrative cost of just finding that, that right help is reduced. Secondly, by getting in early, 
you're going to eventually save money on lower cost of supports down the road and in fact in some cases eliminating the need for those supports. So this is, this is a very uh, important area that, and I think home visiting and other methods of, of recognizing mental health issues and physical disability issues. I can tell a story that I heard here just recently and I don't mean to belabor, but I have a friend who has a granddaughter who at age five, it was determined she was blind in one eye. And they hadn't discovered this until age five when she was pre-tested for kindergarten. Mm -hmm. It turns out she had a cataract. It was, of course, reversible. But what they learned was that because of where the vision neural circuits are and when they develop, they almost didn't catch it. She had about one year left to redevelop the neural circuits for that eye to be able to even use it at all, even though they could re restore the vision. So I do think early, early identification of these issues is, is absolutely crucial, and I think we need to look at policies that will help support that. Yeah, and I think primary care in, is one of those big, big places. Um, this is a major question, um, and one will we'll need to, we only have a few minutes left, but regarding the kindergarten assessment, and, and I think many other things. What conversations have there been to address race and equity? Um, many times, uh, testing and assessment has been uh, based on the middle class white students. In consideration of assessment, please keep in mind race and equity and, and I would say ethnicity issues. So it's a it's a statement in some ways, but maybe uh, any of you want to comment about ways to address that um, differences? I just, uh, <laughs> I've, I've been talking too much here. Um, one of the things I think that is important, and that is the cultural awareness. And I know we've been working with some of the Native American uh, providers and trying to get more cultural uh, emphasis into some of this assessment and readiness, and I think that all across the board, we, need, we do need to take into account societal, societal place and where it affects and how it affects and how we, can, how we can overcome the negative effects that may exist from that. And I guess I'll just, I'll just note that I, mean, I feel like um, at the core of this work is in fact equity. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and recognizing that in our state there are massive disparities uh, between Minnesotans of different backgrounds. Um, and so this is maybe a little bit different than the questions quite getting at, but I just, I'm, so we're gonna hear about the preschool development grant later this morning, and in the work leading up to that grant, um, there was a cross-agency group that came together, and I, I think Stephanie may be able to comment on this, um, on this better, but, but really recognizing that, um, that what we need to be doing is, um, is uh, uh, Closing uh, disparities across different uh, backgrounds. I'm not saying that. Stephanie, you know what I'm talking about? The the goal of that early childhood um, systems reform. Part. Thank you. Yes, because it has such a great mission. It's. Um, are you able to, to to share the mission with with us and remind me of it? Not verbatim, but okay. I think essentially, it is to ensure that our early childhood systems are accessible and adaptable to meet the diverse needs of Minnesota young children and families. And I think the preschool development grant alludes is working on that coordination of services, data sharing in a way that hopefully um, some of these issues will start to be addressed and informed um, in local communities and then bu bubble up to statewide um, changes. And maybe a plug-in for that for that community base. So we have the Community Solutions Fund um, mm -hmm. that uh, Children's Defense Fund and others um, were pushing for, um, recognizing that we need to have empower communities to be figuring out for themselves um, what best steps um, to take. And so that, to my mind, that's that needs to be at the core of this work. And with that, I think we want to give a hand of applause to these leaders and representatives. So thank you. I want to explain that the break today is a little bit longer than usual. Um, we have from, until 10 for, yes, until 1040. So we have almost, I can't do the math, but anyway, almost a half an hour, 25 minutes. And we have tables in the back of uh, some of the coalitions and groups that are, have some work they're doing and they're open to having more conversations. And so I just want to say, be 
on the lookout for that. And Dave, do you want to yeah, add well, any just, more to I that? I just wanted to acknowledge, uh, in addition, we're joined by um, St. Paul City Council Member Rebecca Naker, um, who's here. Um, oh, great. And then um, Representative Amy Wasliver, we're going to hear from later, but just to note, um, and just to point her out in case you want to say hi to her during the break as well. Um, <laughs> Are we joined by any other elected officials that I'm that I'm missing? And if I saw um, somebody, so um, so yeah, so th uh, just want to make sure to acknowledge them and uh, looking forward to the conversation over break. Thank you, Jane, and all. It, you bet. And there are just two tables. One is on, from the Start Early funders, and the other is from the Family Friend and Neighbor group. So, okay. So thank you. See you at 10:40. First, all right. We are. We. I think I'm on. Are we on? Okay. I'm going to uh, call us back together. I had a reminder uh, earlier um, in the break that um, the census is upon us. And I don't want to lose sight of the fact that so often little children are not counted in a household. And I, we don't under, I don't understand all the ramifications of that, but to just call out that please... Um, be aware in your work you have, encourage people, and also know that Hennepin County, for example, is hiring um, workers to do census. Uh, David Canoyer, I happen to know, has been working on native community issues. And so we have some people in the works here, but I, but I would like to just remind people of that. So we're going to get started simply because it's 1041, and Claire Sanford is going to be first up, right? Okay. So is there a slide for you? Oops, sorry. Wrong way. There we go. Do you have something you want to show? Thank you, Jane. All right. Good morning. Thank you very much. I apologize. I have to run out to another meeting as soon as I shut up. Um, I'm Claire Sanford. I work for New Horizon Academy, the child care provider, and I'm also on the board of the Minnesota Child Care Association. And I'm here today representing Kids Can't Wait, which is a coalition of advocates, service providers, small businesses, and more that advocate for access to affordable child care for Minnesota families. And we really have been focused on the child care assistance program, lovingly called CCAP, for the last several years. But we're not only CCAP. We have worked on tax credits and other things for families in the past as well. Um, but before I get started, I just wanted to note, today is the 34th anniversary of the Challenger explosion. And that, for my generation and me personally, because I've always wanted to be an astronaut, that was a really big deal for me. And I actually have a framed photo of the Challenger crew on my desk, because I've, I don't know, that was just a big day in my life. And it's a reminder that doing big things is hard. But we got to keep doing the big things <laughs> and, and getting there. So, sorry, back to Kids Can't Wait. Now, <laughs> that was like a now return to our regularly scheduled programming thing. Um, Kids Can't Wait is focusing on the following three priorities, really the top two priorities. This is not 100% final, um, full disclosure, but hopefully after a meeting tomorrow and votes taken, it will be. Um, the Child Care Assistance Program, or CCAP, provides child care assistance, funding assistance to families from birth up to about age 13. However, it is the largest funding stream for infants and toddlers in low-income families in the state, which is why it's of importance here at the Prenatal to Three Coalition. And it serves roughly 30,000 kids a month. And in 2018, which was the most recent data I could find, 40% of the kids were birth to three. So even though it serves kids up to 13, a really big chunk are in that birth to three section. And why? We all know why. Child care is most difficult to find and most expensive in those birth to three years. So our number one priority is to raise reimbursement rates in the program. You've, you've already heard how bad they are and that we're out of federal compliance and looking at some federal penalties. Um, some have said, well, it's actually cheaper to take the federal penalty hit than it is to raise reimbursement rates and fix CCAP. And if you want to look at it in that individual transaction, that could be true, but that's, of course, not taking into account the costs of what we're doing to the development of children and our current and future economy by, by not getting this right. So 
We want to raise reimbursement rates for providers to the 75th percentile of the most recent market survey, which is the federal recommendation. Currently, we're at the 25th percentile of 2011. And I always like to say it's not an exact correlation, but I couldn't walk into Target and say I'd like to buy that television, but I'm only going to pay you a fourth of what it cost in 2011. No one's giving me that TV. And yet, that's what we expect child care providers to do. And um, the reimbursement rates are directly related to wages in the field, and we cannot keep um, carrying the load of our underinvestment on the backs of the providers who are providing this service. We're also looking at forecasting the basic sliding fee portion of CCAP. Currently, the MFIP portion is forecasted, so if families qualify for MFIP, they get right into child care assistance, but the basic sliding fee portion is not. So we basically tell families, yay, you're low income, we have verified that, and you need economic assistance to get your child into child care and for you to go to work, but there's a waiting list, so we're not gonna give it to you. So if we forecasted those funding needs, anyone eligible for child care assistance would be able to take advantage of it um, as soon as they needed it. And in November 2019, which was our most current wait list report from DHS, there were 1,174 families on the wait list statewide. So that is another concern, obviously. The absolute minimum we need to do, and we're not leading with this because it's the absolute minimum, it's nothing to be proud of, we need to get into minimal federal compliance. The first two priorities go beyond federal compliance towards federal recommendations, but we need to get into minimum compliance with our rates and tie them to our most recent market rates survey um, because we're looking at losing federal money and we're already so underfunded in this area to think of losing additional money that we're currently getting is just unconscionable. And of course, why does this all matter for infants and toddlers? They're the most labor intensive children to provide service for. They're the most expensive for providers. I have yet to meet a provider who makes any money on infants and toddlers. And if we keep squeezing them and squeezing them and squeezing them, when providers cut the services they provide, they're gonna start with infants and toddlers because that's where they lose money and just can't make ends meet. So those are kids can't wait priorities for this year. We're really hoping for some big stuff to happen in the child care assistance realm. Thank you. I'm going to have our speakers, they kind of know their list place, but I'm going to introduce Sue Abderholden, who's a, I'm one of her fans. So, um, but thank you for being here. Thanks. So I'm representing NAMI, I'm the executive director there, National Alliance on Mental Illness, um, but also co-chair of the Mental Health Legislative Network, which is over 40 organizations dedicated um, to improving the mental health of both children and adults with mental illnesses in Minnesota. So we do um, have a focus on early childhood um, on really kind of a couple of areas. Um, one is, is that, you know, I know this group often looks at primary prevention, but we also need to look at secondary prevention. Those children who are clearly at risk of developing poor mental health or in the future um, some type of mental illness. And one thing we've seen is that if you're on MFIP child only, so that means the mom basically has been certified as having a disability, um, she is not required to work. And because she's not required to work, she is also not eligible for child care. And the problem that we've seen for many, many years, because I've been coming here bringing this issue, is that what if that mom really needs intensive treatment um, because she's really, her symptoms are really getting worse. She has nowhere to place that child if she doesn't have a responsible adult that, and good adult, right, that she knows. And what we know is really important is for that child to consistently have an adult respond to them. And so what we wanted to do was just make sure that those parents, on advice of a mental health professional, could actually get child care, either because their symptoms were coming back or they needed intensive treatment. And it would be half time during the week, so we're not trying to, you know, um, cost a lot of money, but just kind of some simple, uh, really a simple solution there. 
Um, the second issue is multi-generational mental health um, treatment and services. So we know, especially with you know, opioids and, uh, of course, alcoholism is still the leading um, type of substance use disorder, um, that sometimes you have the parent who is experiencing a mental illness and the child's mental health is also being impacted. And rather than having several different systems working with the family, you really want a cohesive approach. And so that is the other issue we've been working on. And the last one is expanding funding for early childhood mental health consultation. So we know we have children who are being kicked out of childcare, right, because of their behaviors, um, which are really just symptoms of them not being able to self-regulate and all sorts of things like that. We know early childhood mental health consultation works, but we know that the demands on the few people that we have in the state who are certified are too great and they just can't respond to the need. So last session, we actually introduced a bill that would do all of those things. Um, in the House, we had uh, Representative Morrison as the chief author, and it actually passed Health and Human Services Policy and Finance. So we were pretty excited that we had actually gotten that far. In the final bill, we were able to get $400,000 in base funding for the MFIP child-only um, child care. So that was an important first step. Unfortunately, it was not included in the final HHS um, compromise bill. But at least we got that far, which is farther we've, than we've ever gotten before. On the Senate side, for the first time, Senator Matthews was um, the chief author, we actually had a hearing, which was an amazing step forward, and we had wonderful early childhood mental health professionals come and talk about the need and talk about the research behind it. Unfortunately, it was not included. There was some one-time funding um, for mental health treatment and services for women experiencing pre- and postpartum mood disorders, but as you know, $100,000 doesn't really go very far in terms of doing that. Um, so, and then it didn't get, uh, in, I can't actually remember if it got included in the final bill. So these are the things that we're gonna continue to push this session. Um, you know, in some ways I'm dismayed that these kind of small programs that really focus on secondary prevention haven't had as much traction as they should. So I would really encourage you to help us kind of move this um, over the finish line this session. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Laura LaCroix DeLoon, and I am uh, representing the Minnesota Targeted Home Visiting Coalition. Um, our coalition represents local public health agencies, tribal health agencies, nonprofit organizations, and educational institutions who are providing home visiting services across the state of Minnesota. So we have uh, three priority legislative actions this year. Our top priority is to um, increase the flexibility and access to targeted home visiting programs. For those of you who have been attending these forums on a regular basis, this is a position that the Home Visiting Coalition has maintained since 2017. Our intent is to try to make um, accessible um, evidence-based or evidence-based, evidence-informed and promising practice programs. Currently, funding is available solely for evidence-based programs through this funding source. The addition of evidence-informed and promising practice programs would allow special populations and or families who aren't eligible under the evidence-based programs. So when you have an evidence-based program, they have really tight parameters on who's eligible to receive services. And so we know that there are families who aren't um, accessing home visiting services who may want them. So that is our top priority. Um, the funding stream that is there, we want to impact a current funding stream, so the language would impact either additional funding, which we would love to see um, going forward, and or any time a new grant round is available. So we really are focused on the policy work in this legislative session. Our other two priorities are really um, 
uh, for us to introduce this, um, these ideas and these concepts in this session with a, a heavier push in 2021. But we really want to raise awareness around how Medicaid and insurance play into paying for home visiting services. And so we can look at multiple ways of providing these resources in communities if we are strategic on how they are interacting together. So we want to increase Medicaid reimbursement rates for other professionals or paraprofessionals who are providing home visiting services. In 2017, the state did increase reimbursement rates for public health nurses and or um, nurses, um, RNs who are supervised by a public health nurse providing home visiting services. And it has made a difference at the local level for those who are able to, to um, bill. The other thing that we're trying to do is create or suggest that we create a, a floor of funding. Use the Medicaid reimbursement rate as a floor funding. Everyone who uh, re gets reimbursement for home visiting services has to negotiate with each and every health plan who serves our, um, our Medicaid population. And if we could set a floor rate um, across the board in, in statute that would help out each community. Because right now, the reimbursement rate is really negotiated by each and every single um, local, local public health jurisdiction or county or every nonprofit organization. And so there really is a disparate bar on what that floor rate would look like. So this is an introduction year to offer up these ideas of how do we best maximize any state or federal um, investment that we're making in families. So, thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Lars Negstead. Uh, I'm the policy director for Isaiah, and we're happy to co-chair the Minnesotans for Paid Family and Medical Leave Coalition. That's me and my mom. Uh, almost, uh, or yeah, almost 50 years ago, uh, my mom was a pastor's wife in North Dakota. She grew up here in St. Paul, and I noticed in North Dakota, in this small town. Um, she was a little bored as a pastor's wife there and noticed a need and started a daycare center, a child care center that is still in operation to this day. Um, in our coalition, we say everyone has a story and everyone has a need for paid family and medical leave at some point in their life. Uh, what our bill would do is 12 weeks, up to 12 weeks of partial wage replacement for your own medical leave, including pregnancy complications, and or up to 12 weeks of partial wage replacement for family leave and it would replace those wages on a uh, tiered scale. Uh, it's a social insurance model. It's been passed in now eight other states just uh, in the last, uh, since the last time we've given an update a year ago, Connecticut and Oregon have passed this bill um, and in Washington, D.C. Uh, Washington State just started implementing their benefits this month and I believe there's over 10,000 people that have applied for benefits in Washington State. Uh, it's, so it's, it's a successful model that's been proven to work not only in these other states, but of course, all around the world. Uh, the U.S. is really an outlier in not, uh, not providing this, uh, this benefit. Uh, I was really encouraged by the discussion earlier I heard from the legislators. Um, I was particularly uh, encouraged about the, you know, grappling with family, friends, and neighbor uh, care, which is kind of our informal uh, caregiving network, which we all rely on. And we think the primary solution would be paid family and medical leave, so maybe we should just rebrand paid family and medical leave coalition to family, friend, and uh, neighbor uh, medical and medical leave <laughs> uh, coalition. Um, so uh, there's lots of great arguments for it. Um, last year, we went through 10 committee hearings, which maybe is a record. I don't know, legislators, if you know of any bill that's gone through more committee hearings. Um, Actually, uh, Chair Pinto's committee wanted to hear it and didn't get a chance, so there may be an informational hearing on it in his committee this year, we hope, to lift up the early childhood benefits, which are legion. Um, it passed on, it, in the House as part of the jobs budget bill. Uh, unfortunately, did not um, make it through the conference committee process and never did get heard uh, in the Senate last year. Uh, we understand the House uh, is ready to move it again this year. We hope the Senate will do so this year as well. We think uh, there's more and more evidence for it, more and more support for it uh, all around the state. Um, again, we, we co-chair this coalition 
Now it's over 40 groups. The Minnesota Council of Nonprofits uh, has recently formally signed on, which is really exciting. Uh, to have a, a major employer voice at the table as well. We've also got the Main Street Alliance, which represents small businesses. Um, Children's Defense Fund and AFL-CIO are the co-chairs along with Isaiah. If you have any more questions, I'll be around. would love to talk to you about getting involved. And Deborah Fitzpatrick from Children's Defense Fund is also here um, and uh, is an expert in this issue, actually a nationally recognized expert, and we're lucky to have her expertise too. So thanks very much. Uh, just a quick reminder about the cards. Uh, we'll be collecting those again for a QA. and a And Laura, thank you. Okay, sure. Hi, I'm Laura LaCroix de Lune again. <laughs> this time I'm going to represent the Prenatal to Three uh, Coalition. Uh, so the Prenatal to Three Coalition is uh, what started in 2018. We have two co-chairs, um, Barty Wahi at the Children's Defense Fund Minnesota and then Nancy Jose at West Central Initiative. And really our focus is, is twofold, is to raise awareness about the importance of these early years, building off of these forums, but actually then being able to move some of these policy ideas forward in partnership with many of you around the table, and, um, and then increasing resources. So we um, have a, a pretty large platform that we're moving forward, so I wanted to just highlight the top uh, six priorities. Um, of these priorities, you'll see three of them are around early learning strategies. So I'm going to um, make you pay attention to the boxes. <laughs> so um, The three different early learning uh, strategies are really consistent with what we've talked about already today and what we've heard about today. So we, um, the Prenatal to Three Coalition, works closely with Kids Can't Wait Coalition and are supporting their position around the federally recommended reimbursement rate at the 75% level. What's exciting for those of us who've been working on babies and, and toddlers is that we actually also took a position that we want to see a 100% reimbursement rate for infants and toddlers. We've learned that that's really not possible, but we're super excited about it. <laughs> so we are negotiating and trying to figure out what is actually possible <laughs> so that we can think big around infants and toddlers and knowing how critical it is. And do agree with Lars, though, that... Um, you know, with paid family leave and some other additional child care supports, it would, it would go a long way. Uh, the other uh, position that we have around uh, child care is the early learning scholarships. We know that they've been also a critical um, support system for families and, and allowing them to choose different options um, and have lots of good research on it. The position of the Prenatal 3 Coalition was to actually um, have uh, infants and toddlers as an eligibility criteria on income alone. Right now, they're only based on special needs. So there's different criteria. So it would make infants and toddlers eligible similar to three and four year olds. Now, we don't want to take away scholarships from anyone who has them. And so it would require you to put some additional resources into that pot um, so that we're not taking away from scholarships. But because we know how critical childcare is, what the need is in this state, and how important it is to get started early, um, giving um, both kids and their families a good strong start, we think it's the right position to take. And then the third position is actually an administrative position, and it's uh, the, what, the purple box in the middle. And you've heard a lot about the family, friends, and neighborhood care um, and the need for that. The state of Minnesota, and you're, you're going to hear more about the preschool development block grant, has received some additional um, resources to support all this needs assessment work. Um, and uh, providing support to family, friend, and neighborhood care may be a good way to, so we're going to begin to t talk to them about that avenue. Um, and we're also hosting a meeting, I know I heard some of you are really interested, um, on February 6th, so if anyone wants to join us and talking about some potential legislative strategies, how might the legislature think about um, tackling this issue? So there'll be a number of us meeting on that. Uh, but that would be an administrative strategy. Now, I only have one minute, so I want to just make um, a, a, a plug for the paid family and medical leave. Again, that's one of our top priorities. We know how critical it is to allowing parents and young children to, to build that nurturing, important relationship and how that is a critical way in, in setting all kids and families up uh, moving forward. 
And then the last piece that we have up here that I want to highlight is the culturally responsive and trauma-informed um, healthcare, mental health, and oral health. We know that the health of the individual, the health of the parent, the health of the child really is critical, and we need to start thinking about the full person as we think about these other early ch childhood services that are available. So we will be uh, working with other coalitions to support their efforts around mental health, health, and oral health. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning. So my name is Renal Ray. I am a co-chair for the Voices and Choices Coalition, and I'm also the Associate Executive Director at People Serving People in Minneapolis. Uh, so just a quick overview of Voices and Choices. Um, we're really focused on shaping more equitable policy that will support better outcomes for children of color and American Indian children prenatal through age eight. We work with many stakeholders, many of you in this room and across the state representing parents and communities of color um, and American Indian children. So where we are, Oh, there we go. Um, so where we think we are likely heading for 2020, this has not been uh, fully confirmed by the coalition, and will, probably will be soon, but based on conversations we've been having over the last few months, um, we're probably heading into a place where we are uh, leaning into implementation around the Community Solutions Grant Program. Uh, 2019 was a big year for our coalition in the passage of the Community Solutions Grant Program at the state level. Um, and as a reminder, this really is a program that allows cultural communities across the state to flexibly advance locally generated approaches to improving measures of well-being uh, for children of color and American Indian children. And in fact, there is an opportunity um, kind of through the Department of Health, uh, guided by a 12-member Community Solutions Advisory Council for communities to apply for some of these resources. Uh, the first round is $750,000 um, in various size grants. That application is due on February 7th. There will also be additional resources available through the preschool development grant. Not quite sure what exactly that will look like. But if you know folks who um, are working on locally generated population level ideas and want to investigate some things that could be possible in their communities, please make sure they know about this opportunity. Um, the reason we're really focusing on implementation is because we want to be able to come back in 2021 and increase resources, uh, resources for more community-driven solutions um, around early education. Uh, so then moving into um, kind of where we are thinking we're probably going to be supporting work um, is really around this kind of umbrella definition of quality. Quality has a technical definition. We talked a lot about it today in terms of who has access, outcomes, and um, kind of impacts on children. We have been looking at policy issues that have been coming up over the last few years and thinking about how do we have a broader definition of quality and thinking about quality as specifically as it relates to children of color and American Indian children. So kind of around that, we'll be watching for policy proposals um, and things that have, are coming up around that, de that definition of quality. So for example, how do we um, increase uh, reimbursement rates for child care assistance program as, as Claire and the folks at Kids Count who Kids Can't Wait are talking about, and how do we get to federal conformity to increase those resources? Um, how do we make sure that there is access to the field of child care and retention within that workforce? And how do we not put on um, barriers to being a professional, in particular for uh, communities of color and American Indian communities? Think about quality from a friend, friend family, and neighbor context. Um, uh, and encompassing that in the definition of quality. Uh, additionally, kind of from an administrative perspective, we know there's some really great work um, going on around knowledge and competency frameworks and culture within MDE, and uh, some really great research on implicit bias in early childhood. So thinking about how does that fit into how we think about quality. And then from a place of we're gonna watch out and monitor, looking at the impacts of recent cuts and lack of funding 
uh, for out of school time. So that's kind of where we're headed for 2020, really thinking about implementation and preparation for 2021. Thank you. I'd like to invite uh, the rest of our speakers up again for questions. And we are um, have one right away that I think will... So just, again, if you have a question on a card, raise your arm and hand, both. Um, so here is the online question, which is actually, I would say, what we were just hearing about vis-a-vis -vis the Voices and Choices piece. That, and, and I think if we could hear it from others on, the, um, on our panel now, in what ways is the advocacy process addressing structural racism and disparities? Are people of color participating? So I'll let you start off and then have others chime in. Yeah. Um, so, at People Serving People, I can speak from uh, my perspective. At that organization, we work with families experiencing homelessness, and our parents are the strongest advocates that I've ever met. Um, they advocate every day for the needs of their families and for the needs of their children. It may look different from the way that we advocate at the Capitol, but there is that core of advocacy that exists. I think there's a question around how people access um, and of advocacy at a state level or even at a city and county level um, in a way that they can actually move things forward. So coming, kind of building a coalition and coming at it as a, we are stronger when we are together and when we can collectively advance things that we know parents are telling us and that we ourselves have experienced in some way is a way to kind of move through and work with the system that exists um, to advance more equitable solutions. Anyone else want to chime in? I mean, I guess I would just, is this, um, from paid family and medical leave perspective, uh, I, you know, I neglected to lift up that one in four mothers returns to work uh, when their child is two weeks old. And that is just hard to imagine. Um, mm -hmm. Anybody who's a parent or is around young kids knows that, you know, you really need to be there with your with your baby, and it's heartbreaking. And that, that's a racialized figure, so that it, it's much more likely that a mother of color is gonna be returning to work. Uh, a low-income uh, uh, minimum wage worker is more likely to lack access to any kind of paid leave um, and have to return to work. So the um, access to paid family leave is definitely unequally distributed, and so racial equity is kind of core to our principle. And as we've been testifying through multiple committees on this, we've been pretty careful to lift up both business voices advocating for paid family leave as well as caregiver voices that really reflect, um, you know, the broad diversity of people who need and want paid family and medical leave. Um, we're a statewide organization, so it's really hard to focus on, like, you know, one small community, but what we... Um, what we do have is a young adult multicultural advisory committee who really provide a lot of information to us. Um, we take over 4,000 calls a year from anyone who is, is struggling, so we really hear those stories as well. Um, we have a director of multicultural outreach on our staff as well, so she is going out into the community and hearing the stories. Um, so a lot of our work is actually based on the stories that we heard. So, you know, we heard from a family who said, I can't get childcare, I'm not doing well, you know, I'm, I'm worried that I'm not gonna be a good mother. And so we take those stories and, and turn it into legislation. So um, we're very committed to equity issues um, and continually try to do better. I think the thing I would um, add of uh, for the Prenatal Three Coalition is that the, the vision really is around um, addressing racial, economic, and geographic inequities in Minnesota and how, um, how important it is to get resources and services to families across the state. So that was our initial vision of coming together. Um, for example, last year we worked closely with the um, Integrated Care for High-Risk Pregnancies group and, um, and many of the grantees 
around the maternal death rate because it's four to five times higher in the state of Minnesota for American-born African-American women and indigenous women. Um, and, and that's regardless of education and regardless of income. Um, so, and then we also worked with them around the infant mortality rate. So we really are trying to um, work closely with a number of organizations and work closely with Voices and Choices to try to help support, lend support um, to the Community Solutions Grant Fund as well. Thank you. I would just uh, do a, just a mention, and Laura, you might add to this, but the early childhood and corrections hearing that's going to happen on February 3rd was um, there was a meeting that the Home Visiting Coalition sponsored that I was able to attend, and it talked a lot about the incarcerated population of women in the county jails and how they lose their Medicaid if they're pregnant, and then their own children, if they're particularly housed in a county not their home county, their children lose Medicaid. And it's experienced disproportionately by people of color. So I, I want to call it out because it's kind of like, how do we think about equity? How do we think about racial disparities? And it's so often so invisible to us because this is n these are either populations that we think, well, they just need to be punished, you know, but in fact, a lot of people end up getting punished that create new adverse childhood experiences. And what's so hopeful, I think, about the meeting you held was how counties are working differently around this issue to not, uh, to not make it worse, yeah. but to you know, hold families account people accountable. But do you want to add to that at all, Laura? And sure. Thanks, Jane, for raising that. So for the um, Minnesota Targeted Home Visiting Coalition, we hosted a conversation. And, and really, as Jane said, the, uh, there are a number of counties who are trying to lead in this way. And, and many times, um, the work that is happening is invisible to the nonprofit community who can provide wraparound services and other folks who are interested in, in supporting uh, this work. So we will have a follow-up conversation and I can send mm -hmm. it out to you um, mm -hmm. as well. But what we were sh um, shocked by is the number that one in six children in the state of Minnesota are impacted by incarceration. One in six children, which is yeah. amazing when you look at that. And yeah. those first critical years, if you are pregnant and end up in jail and don't have money to put up for bond um, and you lose your insurance, uh, just that you can just see how it escalates very, very quickly yeah. in creating disparities among families who don't have resources. Yeah, and I would, I would add the other part, and those of us who have ever touched the world of mental health, mental illness, that in, in incarcerated families, that the children visit their mothers or their fathers via video. Yes. And so it's not even in the room. So there's, there's that, but this is, I mean, this is such tough work. So I just, I wanna say, if we're gonna address disparities, this is, I'm gonna say this to Representative Pinto and Senator Ralph, we're gonna to have to have a meeting on, a forum on this as well. But um, I just want to call out that this is a lot of where our disparities also live. So are, do we have any questions, cards? No more questions? OK, so I'm, I'm thankful and uh, appreciate all your work. And we'll be hearing again from you as Time goes on, and I, I'm just grateful for the coalitions and for you coming by again. Thank you. Good luck. So Joan Brandt is here um, on behalf of the Preschool Development Grant, and I think we will just keep moving, and we may end up being finished a little early, which is, which is fine, too. Um, but, I, but there is so much to be, be said about that, that we will... Um, give you a little bit of time if you need it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jane. So, I'm Joan Brandt. I'm the Division Director for Child and Family Health at the Department of Health, and I'm here on behalf of DHS, MDE, and MDH. Um, the Preschool Development Grant has been a great opportunity this past year to really develop relationships working across the departments. 
And we're excited to announce, um, you've, I'm sure you've heard, that we are receiving the implementation grant um, for the next three years. Yeah. I also have to admit I'm a little bit nervous because I've heard it referenced a lot this morning as a solution to a lot of issues. And it is not going to be the solution to a lot of issues. It is a solution to some of the issues. And actually, it's a foundation to build upon, I think, as we move forward. Um, so, by, um, on, the, on that note, um, so the Minnesota uh, Preschool Development uh, Renewal Grant will support the overall goal in more efficiently aligning and coordinating our systems across our departments um, in order to best net help families to navigate um, the systems. We have, the work that we are proposing over the next three years is really based upon a lot of community input. We have done a number, we've done three rounds of community engagement to really understand what families are experiencing and what the needs are so that we can um, do some reforming at the state level, which is going to also take longer than three years. Our systems have been built over how many <laughs> um, decades and are really complicated for families to navigate. We're really aware of that. And to undo those systems and, and create a, a more seamless system for families is going to take longer than three years. But it's a start. Again, it's a foundation for us. Um, we will receive $8.9 million annually for the next three years. Um, that's a little less than what we had proposed. It's about a million dollars less than what we had proposed, but it's a good start. Um, the funding began on December 31st, although the grant agreements are not in place. So even though from a federal perspective, the grant funding is in place as of December 31st, um, the work will not begin until grant, grant agreements are in place. But it's through December 30th of 2022. Um, and it means that our three departments, and I think we would continue the partnership even though um, even if we hadn't received the funding, but it really gives us, a, again, a solid foundation to continue. Um, you see the vision there. It was referenced earlier this morning. This is the vision of the Early Childhood Systems Reform Group. Um, we have adopted that as our vision moving forward. So I have to take my glasses off to see this one because my, my words are really, really small. But the message is clear that we and state agencies have a lot of work to do, putting children and families at the center of our work. Our systems have not worked well. They're complex and hard to navigate. The, in, um, the intake that each um, program requires is um, overwhelming for families and um, oftentimes is similar information between programs that we um, are asking for. So that is one of the things that we will be looking at. We need to regain trust because um, families don't trust us in government. We understand why not. A piece of that, certainly a large proponent of that, I think, is certainly the systemic racism that exists within state systems. Um, the grant gives us an opportunity to really work, work differently and to work better as we move forward. So what you see here are some of the comments that we um, heard from community members um, who participated in the community engagement process, as well as the um, various pieces of the work that we will be doing. Um, we will continue with the community engagement and partnership. We are, um, will leverage the community solutions. Um, as you heard, um, we, we are putting additional funding into the community solutions fund um, to up that ante in order to really hear from the community, the community, give funding to the community to um, identify their needs and, and best solutions. Um, we'll increase act access to supports and services. Um, we're looking at the quality of our services um, we will monitor, we, we have an evaluation component that is built in, including indigenous evaluation. Um, and we'll be leveraging the uh, leadership of the Children's Cabinet as well, because they are certainly one of the partners in this work. So our activities include updating the needs assessment and strategic plan by 2022. We had to do a needs assessment this past year. Um, the needs assessment will be updated as we move forward. Um, we hope to see this as somewhat flexible in, in our um, the, uh, process. We will be funding Help Me Connect, um, which is a centralized system to enhance navigation for families. 
um, kind of a one-stop shop is what we're hoping eventually. Um, it, it's being somewhat piloted with providers right now, um, but the intent is that it will be expanded so that families eventually will have access as well for um, referral. And it's more than just um, for educational referral or healthcare referral, it is abroad. We hope that if families have housing needs, it's also a way to um, shift them into um, a referral for housing program. And we'll include a warm handoff. We, um, one of the things that we are very aware of is missing is that when referrals are made, there's not necessarily follow through to assure that, that um, those referrals have closed the loop. And so that's a part of this Help Me Connect. Um, investing in community solutions, which I've already mentioned, um, specifically prioritizing people of color and American Indian by building upon the Community Solutions Fund. Um, we want to pilot six to ten local cross-agency hubs um, that will help in a prevention strategy and th that will test the Help Me Connect. So those will be hubs that will sit in community. We don't know what those will look like. We don't know who will hold those hubs. It, it is highly likely that it will vary across the state in terms of who holds the hubs and what they look like because, again, this will be based on what the community sees as best um, for implementing the hub model. We'll also be exploring technology to increase information sharing um, in order to coordinate. One of the things that has been a barrier, um, particularly when you think about intake, has been the inability for us to um, share data across the systems. And so um, in addition to not being able to, we don't have a network that re, uh, speaks to one another across our departments and our systems. So it, this is one of the areas that we are examining and, and looking at as we move forward. And then um, there's quite a bit of work also around early childhood workforce supports um, and uh, developing cultural competency and trauma-informed work. Finally, um, we will be engaging, as I've mentioned, in this ongoing community engagement process, just as we've done over the last year in order to inform and update our needs assessment and strategic plan as long as well as keeping us um, kind of honest as we move forward. Are we getting it right? Are we doing it in a way that it needs to be done? Um, we'll uh, develop a communities of practice for the hubs and subgrantees so that there is a ability to learn from one another and teach one another in terms of what's working within the communities. Um, we'll have a communications contract so that we are um, certain that we're providing our um, materials in translated format um, as well as online, um, that we have graphics and that it's done in plain language so that it really is accessible to um, families and communities. And then, of course, as I mentioned, there is an evaluation component as well, um, and we'll have an uh, expert on indigenous evaluation, um, and as well as partnering with some existing evaluation work within the state, um, results first, whole family systems and community solutions. And, and any other that might be out there. So that's it on my um, part. If you have specific questions beyond what I might be able to answer, because this is really high level, um, there is a, a, a website as well as an email um, that will, you can um, send questions to and we can respond as well. We're take some questions. Okay. So, um, Senator Ralph, we'll let, how about you come up and then, but the rest of you, I'm sorry, we're giving him senatorial privilege, but, um, <laughs> but if, you, if you have a card, then we'll collect. Also, so, he's, he's going to get you a mic. Okay, got it. There it goes. There. I, guess, I guess my question is, um, more about measuring the results and the outcomes. And so I, I guess my question is, do you have, a, have you established a set of metrics to determine success or failure in the, in other words, you're, you're kind of going to have a, a 30,000 foot view here, but there's going to be a lot of little projects going on. And I just, I wonder as part of the grant process that you are providing requirements that there be some specific metrics established to determine how well things are going. 
Um, absolutely. We'll be, uh, do we have those in place right now? Not fully, no. But that will be part of the evaluation development process um, so that we know that we're doing the right thing and doing it well. Mm -hmm. We'll pass the mic, but we do have um, a question about what, who or, am I on? Uh, there. Who or what agencies are in the community engagement group? Now, are they, is, so that kind of gets to the question of, with the contracts, is that will there be RFPs? It'll be new. It'll yeah, be there'll, new. Yeah, there'll be RFPs that will go out. Um, so it will, we're done with uh -huh. year one. And now we'll, we're starting over with years one through three um, with the implementation grant. So there will be a new RFP process, yes. Okay. What I was really interested in is you had talked about um, the community engagement, not the specific grants, but where you were getting your information about how to reform right. the system and, and who and what are those people or agencies so, or people? This past year, and I'm not going to be able to get all of them off the top of my head, but it was the Minnesota um, Initiative Foundations um, had a grant, uh, the Children's Defense Fund had a, uh, a grant, and um, Minnesota, the Indian Women's Resource Center um, are the three that I can think of off the top of my head. I, I think there were probably more, and there may be somebody out there who could answer that better, but those they're the ones who took the, um, the questions out to the community for us because they've got the relationships we don't um, and, and did the community input, brought it back to us. Um, it was um, analyzed. We took it back out. It was, um, we listened again, took it back out, listened again. Um, it will be new, potentially, could be the same groups going forward, um, but there will be a new RFP that will go out, so it could be new groups as well. We don't know. Mm -hmm. I'll ask questions. I'll ask questions. There we go. Um, and see if anybody else has one in the meantime, which is, can you talk in a little more detail about the early childhood workforce supports, that last bullet on the list? I'm just interested as to if there's any I wish more I you could. can share. Okay. I'm the wrong person to ask that to. Um, okay. That we have had kind of clusters of people who have been working on specific areas, and that is more outside my realm. That has been sitting more in education and DHS than MDH. Okay. Okay. But certainly, um, as we move forward, there will be more. Um, we at MDH recognize that family home visiting needs to be a part of that conversation, and so we will be more engaged in that as we move forward. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll be, we'll want to hear from you soon and again. Happy and, uh, to. When we know so more. So the website, and the website is up there. Is up there. Um, education. So it's the Minnesota Department of Education website, M-D-E-D-S-E slash early slash P-R-E-S-C-H-G-R. Slow down. Okay. <laughs> so it's the Minnesota Department of Health, at, uh, Minnesota Department of Education website. But then after MDE slash DSE small letters slash early slash preschool grant. So it's P R E S C H G R. And and we will post that I think on That would be good. Our our own website too. That'd be great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Yeah. So the family child care task force is going to report next, and um, we have Representative Waslick here. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Representative Amy Wozlowick. I am one of the co-chairs of the Family Child Care Task Force, um, along with Senator Mary Kiffmeyer from the Senate. Um, I don't have a long update today, but I will do a brief update, and then if folks have questions, feel free to ask some questions. 
Um, so the Family Child Care Task Force um, is a pretty large group of people. I think it's around 25 folks, um, and it includes child care providers, parents, and representatives from organizations and nonprofits associated with child care, as well as um, some other organizations that do this work in greater Minnesota and um, some organizations that are um, aligned with provider groups as well. So there's a, a large group of people from a bunch of different places. We have a parent aware rep as well. Um, we had our first meeting in September of last year, and um, we've discussed several of the duties um, and made progress on a few of them. And I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna read all the duties, but I just wanna highlight um, the few that we've talked the most about. So the, the couple that we've talked the most about as a task force were duties one through three. And those are, um, those revolve around identifying difficulties that providers face regarding licensing and um, inspection. And so part of our, our role with that um, is that we're working with the Children's Cabinet. Stephanie mentioned this briefly in her update. We're working with the Children's Cabinet to get a survey sent out to providers who have closed their, their child care businesses in the last few years to find out um, more specifics about why they closed. Um, so there's been lots of talk about over-regulation generally, um, but over-regulation generally doesn't help us as policymakers actually change things to make them work better for providers. So what we're trying to do is to get more specific ideas um, uh, what sorts of regulations are, are impacting providers and, and maybe um, pushing them to close their, their child care businesses and how can we as legislators change those to make things work better. Um, another thing that we're talking about, um, which is duty number three, is looking at variances. Uh, so variances are essentially um, counties have um, the opportunity to say, for example, if there's something short-term going on with a family child care provider, maybe they have one additional child in an age group for a month. Um, they would be able, licensors would be able to grant a variance for a short period of time um, to a family child care provider to make sure that they can take the children and also maintain their business. So we have looked at um, fixes to issues that have come up with variances that we've heard from providers and licensors. Um, those are things around um, liability. There was a case a couple decades ago where some, some injury or some harm, some harm happened to a child um, when there was some sort of variance. And so there's something in statute that says that's questionable about whether individual licensors who grant variances are liable. And so we want to clear that up and make sure that we're making that clear for providers and for licensors and for counties so that they are able to grant those variances. Um, we're also looking at potentially creating a uniform variance form um, so that we have a clear idea of what, is that, what does that look like and what does that mean? And, and so providers, are, providers and licensors are more um, able to understand that county to county and it's not different than every county. Um, we're also looking at um, requirements to inform the public and providers about variance policy. So having, some, uh, having a policy pl uh, placed on a website but also being made available to providers if they want it. Um, and to new providers when they start. So wanting to make sure that we're pushing that information out, um, that we're doing what we can to uh, try and make things uniform. And uh, variances is probably a piece that we're gonna come back to on the task force because we have some outstanding work on that issue. Um, we also have been talking a lot um, about duty number two, which is uh, revolves around um, abbreviated inspections and a tiered violation system. So essentially, um, we had a presentation from uh, Dr. Feeney, who is an expert in this area. He's done a lot of work with other states around these issues. And um, we discussed tiered licensure and abbreviated inspection, or tiered violations, not licensure, um, and talked about whether we want to take it that way. That's kind of a what I would call a band-aid approach to some of the issues we're seeing, or whether we actually want to have a broader conversation around the actual rule that governs family child care providers. Um, so that was something that we discussed as a task force, which way do we want to move? I don't know that we came to a decision. Um, I think it was just up for discussion, but that's a piece that we're talking about and considering too is how do we, how do we move forward um, with these ideas and, and what do we do, rule, statute, where do all these things fit? So that's a, an ongoing conversation that we're having as well. Um, our interim report is due in March, and uh, our next task force meeting is February 4th, so we're going to be discussing uh, the draft of that report at the next meeting and hopefully coming away with some recommendations and some, some policy ideas and some legislation to work on this session. So that's, that's all I have. Um, if folks have any questions, I can try and answer those. I'll just ask my colleague if she can um, uh, expand just a little bit on the point about the, the rule. It's in the second to last bullet there, because I was really shocked to learn that our child care regulations for family child care, I think probably they all, but certainly this set dates back to the 1980s. Um, so it sure seems like it's time to, to redo those. But if you can talk about that. Yeah, and we had talked about that in the context of when we're looking at um, big changes like uh, tiered violation system and the abbreviated inspections. Those are things that are pretty big changes. And so our discussion revolved around do we want to 
tr try and work on that, or do we want to actually look at this rule and try and just discuss having a rulemaking process to update the rule, talk about what's in rule and statute, compare those things. Um, and so we, Dave and I had a conversation with Senator Kiffmeyer about that. Do we, at least we, we want to know what's in rule and statute first, and then have a conversation about what do we do going forward. Um, the rule is very outdated, and uh, there are things in there that we've kind of tried to tweak along the way to make them work better, but I think an overhaul of the rule is is where we need to go. If we're gonna make any progress on these issues that family and child care providers are talking about, uh, we really need to look at the whole system and uh, what we can do better within that system to make things work for family and child care providers. Um, I have a question. It may, I'm on, okay. Um, how does Minnesota's county administered state supervised arrangement work vis-a-vis -vis licensors that I think are hired by the counties, is that right? Um, that seems to be a difference of application sometimes. Of yeah, rules. so I think that's the, one of the issues that's actually come up on the task force is um, DHS, um, they, do, they do child care centers, um, and then the family child care providers are actually the licensors are county staff. Um, and so the county is in charge of that process um, and so what we see across different counties across the state is that people are doing things differently, um, which can lead to a lot of confusion um, for folks in different counties, especially when they're reaching out to ask for help. And, you know, you have to know the specific county, uh, whether that's variance policy or something else, when you're trying to, to help problem solve. So I think that's a piece that we're looking at um, with a lot of these things is how do we, um, is, is there any work that we can do to make that uh, more, you know, anything more uniform across counties. We don't want to say you have to do it this way, but if there's something that is a pretty simple thing, like the uniform variance form that we talked about, um, if there's something that we can do in that realm to make it easier for providers to understand um, and easier for folks to navigate that system, you have providers move from one county to another and now everything's different. So wanting to make sure that we're doing what we can to address those concerns mm -hmm. um, so that when, when there is any sort of shifting around that people, it's not, it's not like it's a whole new system. Right. Got it. Okay. Hello back there. Anybody else? Well, I think, oh, sorry. Oh, can you say more about the tiered licensure? Yeah, and actually that should say tiered violation. I put the wrong word in there. So essentially what a tiered violation system is, um, we've, we have a little bit of that right now in the state. We have a fix-it ticket, um, which would be like a lower level. So um, generally when they think about a tiered violation system, it's risk-based. So what is the risk to the safety and health of the children um, in, a, in, a, in a child care setting? Um, and so you would have, you know, those low-risk things would be like a fix-it ticket. The next, the next level would be... I don't know what we would call it, but there would be several levels. And so you wouldn't have everything being like correction order. Like it would, there would be a system and there would be different levels in that system so that you could have something like a fix it ticket that's a minor issue that could be corrected right away that would not show up anywhere. So you're not gonna have something showing up on a provider's on the website um, where, where folks might find it if they're able to, to take care of it and fix it right away versus something that's a more serious, uh, more serious sort of, um, uh, not violation, but, but something that someone, a uh, licensor would find um, when they do an inspection. If there's something more serious, that would be, that could be a correction order, it could be something else. We haven't uh, talked much about that, but that's certainly something that providers are really interested in, um, and DHS is certainly interested in figuring out how to make that work better, because there is a lot of concern around, um, you know, these more minor violations becoming a bigger issue than they should be for providers, and um, also conversation around correction orders and what those mean, and and how long, they, how long they're, they're posted and all sorts of conversation around that. So those are all, all pieces of the conversation that we're having. And um, I expect we'll, we'll return to that uh, com part of the conversation um, later as we continue our work. So will you have a website that people can re write into or comment on? Or? Yeah, there is a website. I actually have it, the web page pulled up on my phone right now. Um, let me see. really long but if you um, <laughs> it's it's really deep in on the DHS website but if you if you look up family child care task force Minnesota it brings you right to the web page okay. and it has a list of our duties that we've been assigned via statute it has all of our meetings it has the minutes and, and, and materials and recordings from our meetings up to a certain point um, mm -hmm. and then it also has information about membership and background info that's great and we'll again I think um, we'll find a way to post yeah. that but um, thank you for that any other
I think we're I think we're good. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I think we're we're wrapping. So, um, so typically, Senator Ralph and I wrap up. Um, he unfortunately had to leave uh, just a few minutes ago, just a little bit early. Um, but I want to thank uh, thank everyone for coming and for um, for the work. I want to make sure, especially, to thank and acknowledge. If we could have the members of Elders for Infants, please stand, um, and so uh, you can be recognized. The Avengers of Early Childhood, as I as I like to call them. Um, and uh, this is I was explaining to some folks for whom this is their first time. This event is really held together with. Um, uh, a little bit with duct tape, and uh, and it's all volunteers. And so, um, just want to recognize uh, Melanie Hazlip, um, who's uh, St. Kate's student, is working with my office this year, and she's um, helping to coordinate um, the forums. Yeah, we can applaud Melanie's work. Um, and my, my legislative assistant, Polly Sirkvenik, was here, and so there's just, it's a number of us doing this on a, uh, coming together to make this, make this happen. And so I just want to encourage all of us uh, this coming legislative session, especially to be looking for as many opportunities as we can to collaborate and to move things forward. I think that, um, I think you could uh, note, many of us involved in politics, politics could note a number of flashpoints that we potentially sort of touched on. There's various issues involving child care regulation and the child care assistance program, and for some folks, um, uh, uh, Various, various other issues, um, the more that we can have uh, the needs of young kids and their families in mind in the coming months, and the more that we can uh, push, and, and uh, there's going to be uh, disputes and issues in various other areas, but the more that we can be pushing forward together in this area and recognizing that as we do that, of course, we all benefit. And so I hope that we can do that together. Um, we're going to uh, let you have a little more time in your day, which seems like not a bad thing to end a few minutes early. Thanks so much, everybody, and then look for another forum uh, in just a few months. Thanks so much. Appreciate it.